I'm not doing the Zork Grand Inquisitor review today because... Happy Father's Day, Dad. Warcraft 2 will live on in our memories. And with Starcraft, it is hard to forget campaign and land sessions with you. The latter of which featured iTunes music over the muted game soundtrack. Enjoy the review. What do you do after you make a successful sequel to the first Warcraft game? Make an action RPG named Diablo. No, wait. You make a new RTS game named StarCraft, with a Warcraft 2 engine. But what if the reaction to its early stages of development, as shown at E3 1996, was not exactly that great, to the point of audiences mocking it and calling it Orcs or Warcraft in space? Well, you go back to the drawing board, and come up with a new story, a new engine, and above all, three different races instead of the usual two equal sides that feature in a chess game. The story of StarCraft certainly is not rooted in fantasy fiction much like the Warcraft games were. It is the 24th century, and the Earth is overpopulated. So a bunch of humans, generally known as the Terrans, are exiled and sent on a colonizing mission. This is further complicated as the exiles fight with each other and separate into different governments, with the oppressive confederacy being the strongest. But rebellions within the Terran ranks aren't the only problem the confederacy has to deal with, as various planets are infested with insectoid creatures known as Zerg. An advanced alien race named the Protoss destroy planets to reduce Zerg numbers, but their actions also get the Terrans caught in the crossfire. Across three story-driven campaigns, one each for Terran, Zerg and Protoss, you, the player, witness betrayals, revolutions, changing sides, not to mention cool moments and some interesting lore and mythology, including a mysterious and ancient race named the Zel Naga that are heavily connected to the non-human creatures. The presentation of the story in this game has to be commended in contrast to the Warcraft series. First of all, each mission briefing actually features characters talking to each other, and the voice acting and dialogue are generally strong. On top of this, story events also occur during scenarios, sometimes when you least expect it. Gone are the days of simply starting a scenario, playing it to completion and going to the victory screen. In fact, the expansion to the game Brood War, more on that later, takes it a step further, with more unpredictable twists that even change the gameplay slightly. More could be said about this and the overall story that was created for the StarCraft universe, but to say any more would be a spoiler. So the story is generally presented well, but what about the graphics and sound? Well, the graphics are arguably dated by today's standards, especially in regards to resolution, pixelation and so on. But its differences in its new engine that were put into place after E3 996 can't be ignored. While the perspective is a top-down bird's eye view like pretty much any RTS game, it is more isometric. And what a difference a reworked engine makes. Hand-draw graphics are replaced with render graphics with sprites, backgrounds and some nice textures and lighting. The composers from Warcraft 2 returned to do the music score, and they did a good job yet again. Melodies are well done, complimentary and memorable, with distinct tracks for each of the three races, such as the dark undercurrents of the Zerg. Some of it seems reminiscent of that from the Alien films. Plus those films are just one out of many references that inspire the game. And speaking of which, the aforementioned voice acting comes alive when you click on a unit multiple times to annoy them, like in previous Blizzard Entertainment games. Oh my god, he's wet. I vote we frag this commander. The large variety of units to play with, complete with these different sound bites, not to mention distinct looks, especially across the three races, means that the game contains so much personality. In saying all of this, Easily the most memorable aspect of StarCraft is the gameplay. First of all, let's get the obvious stuff out of the way. Much like in Warcraft 2, you have to instruct your workforce to collect resources, which consist of minerals and gas this time, and create and manage units and buildings, as well as create supply units slash buildings to keep up with the number of units you have. After that happens, it's all about attack, attack, attack! 
The controls for this are understandable and are elaborated on from past games, although they were mostly featured in the Battle.net edition of Warcraft 2. The right click function that is used for instantaneous actions instead of clicking on an icon in the bottom right corner is certainly helpful. You can double click a unit multiple times to bring any duplicates of that unit into a group. No dragging the mouse pointer or clicking units one by one. You can give a series of orders or waypoints to a unit by holding down the shift key and choosing other units, actions such as move or build, and sections of of a map. Combine all of this with hotkeys and hearing the last orders or alerts of attack through the spacebar and you can execute many actions per minute. Despite the advances in technology, both in the setting of the story and the tweaked engine and controls, units can still get stuck while moving around. It can be argued that with these changes however, that those who played RTS games like Warcraft 2 may find this game harder to get to grips with, and that especially applies to the differences between the three different races. This is not a chess match where the playing pieces are exactly the same, with the victory ultimately determined by the player's strategic prowess, or in this game's case the speed and urgency and the ability to think on your feet. Let's look at the key differences between the three races without analysing every single unit building or technology. The way the Terran build and use units and buildings should be familiar to any Warcraft 2 veterans. Makes sense since they come from Earth. Just construct a building pretty much anywhere, pretend the supply depots are farms, and use units and technology accordingly. Also, most buildings can lift off the ground, which also adds to the cool sci-fi nature of the game. But the Zerg and Protoss are not like this. The Zerg can only have buildings on a biomass called Creep that spreads from a hatchery and its colonies. Plus, the working drone has to sacrifice itself to make a building, and any and all units come from a hatchery provided you have the right buildings, such as a spire for mutualisks. The Protoss must construct additional pylons, not only as a supply, but to provide a power grid for buildings, which create units normally like the Terrans do. The working probe can teleport a building in and go off to do something else, though the working SCV of a Terran can't take a break during construction. Also, the supply of a Zerg actually come in the form of units themselves named Overlords, which also function as detector or scout units. Finally, Terran buildings and mechanical units can be repaired, Zerg units and buildings slowly heal themselves due to their organic nature, and Protoss units and buildings can only take damage once the shield is depleted from constant attack. If any of that sounds overwhelming, give it time to sink in, because after you spend some time in the game, you can appreciate the gameplay and mechanics, the strategies and the developers' best efforts to make each race balance despite such differences. In fact, there are more similarities than you may think. Remember the Overlords being detector units? Well, they can detect any units that are capable of being invisible, so that you're less likely to be surprised by stealth attacks. All three races have their share of detectors and invisible units, basic and advanced buildings and upgrades, as well as mixture of ground and air units that can only be damaged by specific attacks, plus different technologies and techniques, or to loosely call them, spells. Going back to the differences again, you may find contrasts such as the Protoss shields give them an innate advantage, but get this, there are more expenses and waiting time for Protoss, which makes for a quality over quantity approach. Zerg units are weaker and cheaper with reliance on sheer numbers, and the Terran occupy a middle ground between the two. Overall, getting to grips with the free races can be quite a fun and rewarding experience, with the lengthy campaigns that get more difficult with each mission being a good way to do so. If the placement of the instructions for multiplayer at the beginning of the game's manual is any indication, the multiplayer is one of the key aspects that makes this game addictive. You can also do scenarios by yourself against the AI, but they seem to tend to know what you're doing. If you could play online with other people, or get people together for LAN sessions, you're in for a good time. There's a good reason multiplayer sessions of StarCraft led to it being quite the esports sensation, and that is partially due to rushing, the concept of beating your opponent in roughly 15 minutes or less, with the earliest units in the tech tree. To keep the balance, Blizzard updated the game to the point of changing the cost of a Zerg spawning pool from 150 to 200 to make rushing with Zergling swarms fairer. And speaking of updating the game, the expansion Brood War adds new tile sets such as Snow and especially new units including a much needed medic to heal non-mechanical Terran units. The new features work out well, but the campaigns are significantly more difficult than those in the original, though they do expand on the story. Outside of campaigns and scenarios, there's a campaign editor to make your own maps and scenarios, complete with options such as adjusting the difficulty of the AI or creating interesting triggers that can allow for scenarios that simply aren't about destroying everything. So what else is there to say about StarCraft? Well, apart from the infiltration scenarios of the campaign that 
are somewhat underwhelming. Some of the flaws can make the game somewhat hard to get to grips with, plus it probably hasn't aged well by today's standards. The max number of units in a group can't exceed 12 outside of controlling multiple groups with the number hotkeys, something that would be remedied in StarCraft 2. This may mean people may have got tired of the game roughly 20 years after its release. But it has to be said, StarCraft has quite a legacy behind it. It expanded on and changed some of the features from past RTS games which can be seen as an improvement. The fact that there are three races that are different to each other, yet are surprisingly balanced, is notable for the genre. The multiplayer is addictive and very competitive when it comes to esports, plus the single player campaign is cool too. You can very likely run StarCraft and its expansions on a modern computer, but if not, there's a remaster of a game with the same gameplay, but with production values and internet features that are more reminiscent of those in the sequel. If this is your first time playing StarCraft, give it a bit of time, and before you know it, you won't want to turn off the computer for some time.